help from from upstream. I, I believe I think Magdowitz said she said something about their mood sensing that we cannot rely on on, on their mood sensing at all, and we have to keep uh, thinking of the in situ data. Uh, I, th I mean, I don't agree with this statement because, I mean we still can use the remote sensing for making decisions uh and this is if you if you if you if you think about some most of the agencies in the in the water business they are using some of the forecasting model to uh to predict the water or uh, the, the flow in the river and then making decisions based on that to uh, to operate the dams uh, um, so so we can think about sensing something very similar to these forecasting models uh, because if the remote sensing is able to see something in the upstream and there is a travel time or it's taking time for the water to reach from the upstream like ethiopia to eat to egypt can take like two to three weeks so if we if we understand something from the remote sensing in the upstream it's exactly like using the forecasting model and then we can adapt the operation in in, in the down uh, in the downstream countries like uh adapting adapting the operation of the highest one dam so i just want to highlight this that remote sensing is still beneficial uh, and we can think about it exactly like the forecasting models that are being used in most of the water agencies in the in the nile basin or uh, uh in general so thanks again yeah, so I'm going to pass the same question to uh, Professor Assad in terms of uh, climate change. But I want to add also from Sudan's perspective, uh, at least some of the models I have seen uh, in terms of climate change, that uh, the variability in the upper Blue Nile would, would increase. Uh, in fact, you would think that GERD uh, helped on that to, mit to mitigate some of them. And you know very well the 2020 uh, flood, which we looked at it, that that flood was actually once in 100 years event, uh, it's more than 11 or so uh, cubic meter per second at, at its highest. And, and we know what kind of devastation it did to Sudan. But uh, with GERD, at least one of that, uh, and Dr. earlier study that I mentioned with uh, Dr. S uh, Khalid, uh, he did not look actually in terms of the avoided cost of uh, damage to people and to properties. He just looked at uh, some of the, uh, you know, the benefit from other aspects. So given that, um, um, how do you see going in? For sure, I agree with you that they need data communication. That's for sure because it's not a lot of space. But even more, then that's where the the value of GERD, in fact, plays much more to Sudan than than anyone else uh, from this perspective. So, what do you what do you see? Okay. Yes, I will. Okay. Thank you very much for bringing the 2020 flood events, and I think. We, I think uh, some of the reasons to say that is I have been doing is that is uh, shows that is the droughts and the floods in the upper Nile, Nile, uh, upper Pillow Nile are actually related to a phenomenon called atmospheric rivers. So when those atmospheric rivers are present for a long period of time, for a particular number of days, you will have floods, and when they are absent, also you will have uh, droughts. So in terms of um, climate change, if you look at the whole nine basin, you know, the recent international IPCC report, International Panel of uh, what Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has painted a very complex picture for uh, for rainfall in terms of spatial and temporary variability of the Nile Basin. Um, they have said that in terms of East Africa, they will be increasing the mean annual rainfall. They will be increasing the temperature, but on the other hand, you have increasing the intensity of extreme flood, that is floods and drought. So that is, again, uh, will make things a little bit complex in terms of um, uh, trying to uh, manage water resources and also it will make it uh, it will make it also more challenging you know for uh, for agriculture because ag because you know if you have higher temperature also you have higher evaporation uh, losses and also it it will be an issue for food security because there is a lot of agriculture within the basin which are which are actually dependent or rain-fed agriculture. So it's not just the issue of, of dams. So it's much, much actually uh, uh, wider issues. Of course, you know, um, we, have to, um, we have to be adaptive. We have also, uh, in terms of uh, operating 
um, our water resources. We have to look very closely at how we operate the dams, right? And also we need to look at um, uh, different ways of maybe improving, maybe irrigation efficiency, for example. We need also to uh, improve uh, community resilience. And this is an area where all the countries actually will collaborate. But however, I said that is in terms of before implementing uh, these changes, there is a need for more localized studies. And that is where the, the countries would collectively benefit from that one. If all they expect from these countries, you know, they have come and agreed maybe on a framework they make the data available, then I think that is will will make huge uh, be, will huge difference, you know, to the decision making with regard to water, agriculture, and, and other aspect within the basin. But that's of course, you know, require uh, uh, require trust and requires also scientists to uh, to come together. Of course, people will have their different views and different opinion, but. However, difference is also good because it will enable you to look at the problem from different perspective. We don't have to agree on everything, but we need to, to, to listen and see what the other people are saying. I think that is actually very, very uh, important. In terms of Gerdam, um, the, what do you call it? Having extreme events, that could also be good or bad. It depending on how the frequency of the droughts will occur. For example, if you have extended period of droughts, that's, that will be a big challenge, especially that is for, for, the, for, for maybe for the filling of the gear dam and also for how do we operate the high dam of S1. Also, it will be a very challenge also to the Sudanese because they need also information about uh, how much water will be released and how much water will be coming so that is they will uh, will be able to operate their dams again the dams in sudan if you compare their sizes with the high dam as one of as one or maybe they're they just like babies you know they are very 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 tiny and they depends on the water which is stored within uh within the flood season so they are actually they have to be very very careful about how they actually operate their dam and again uh, they have to be a cooperation, you know, for, for those dams, you know, with the existence of big dams also in the SUV, and there have to be um, a greater cooperation, you know, uh, in terms of uh, information sharing. Because the last time, I think 220 or something like that one, uh, the first filling of the gate dam has uh, caused some problems for... Uh, water supply station you know taking water from the from the nile because they have been sudden withdrawal of the water and then most of the water supply station within the nile basin also they have gone out of operation that should not have happened because if there is a coordination then of course they could have released more water earlier to avoid that situation so that situation this is why in sudan we are very very concerned about the impacts of of gates on 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 sudan because our dams are very small we don't have a buffer so basically it's like you could compare it to something like be as you go so whatever water you um you get you store it for a short time and then you release it so we don't have that big buffer which will enable you to um uh, what do you call it uh, to mitigate the effects, say for for a pro, for a prolonged drought, we don't have that capacity, so we have to rely on the water which comes each year. Yeah, I certainly agree that they need to cooperate. But uh, the 2020, I was watching closely. In fact, the Sudanese person sent me the flow at uh, at uh, El Daim, and uh, it's not true. They they had a minimum of I remember like hundred. Uh, millimeter cube per day and he sent me the flow and they were they sent this me this information to me uh, where he was saying hey god cause uh, uh, in, uh, exasperate the, the, the flooding uh, so it is there was not drought there so but anyway that's it's a measurement yeah i do, ha is, I do it, have it, the data 
I do have the yeah. data and there was enough water going at that time. But I want you raise a very important point regarding uh, conservation. And before I pass to uh, uh, Magdala, and this is, comes back a whole lot to Egypt as well. Uh, the, I, most of the time we tend to look only supply side, but we need to see at the demand side. Demand side, whether it is the, uh, irrigation, whether it is urban water supply, which is my area, for example, um, we need to figure out how best to use our demand. It's not, it's not like, okay, this is my need. There is, I want to keep that need, regardless of where the flow is. At some point, it's not gonna be enough, the whole Nile for all of them. So uh, I think I want uh, Dr. Isham, you to start. And there has been some studies in terms of where some of these efficiency issues are with Egypt in terms of, you know, loss and irrigation, other uh, supplies. So that improvement alone, and this was some of your studies, some of them are people are arguing about the numbers. Uh, I wouldn't quote them, but I think there are, there are significant number actually. So what else can we do from the demand side? We shouldn't be only looking at the supply side. It's just because we want, uh, we cannot make up the flow. The same thing with Sudan as well. It's not, this is my wish, but our wish may not be possible because we have to share what we have. So how do you see the demand side? What else can we do on the demand side to have, you know, um, efficient use of, of our resources? And I'll start with you, Dr. Hashim. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I agree with you when we are looking at this, uh, at this issue, we have to look at both sides, the demand and supply as well. Uh, yeah, just before before saying my uh, my take here, I, I'm not representing Egypt, by the way. I'm just... <laughs> uh, yeah, we yeah, understand. Okay. <laughs> none of us. None of yeah, us. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, because, yes. Because, you know, yeah, yeah, I see like, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, so, I mean, I, I, I agree, as I said, like we have to look at the supply and the demand side and, and from... From the supply, we say we have to share the data. We have to take into consideration the climate change, the climate variability, and and the dam operation. All, all of this is, is is very important for the for the supply side. But when you talk about the demand side, we have to see how much water is 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 needed for uh, for the irrigation. And there is, I think, there is two things we have to 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 uh, to think about. It one, I mean, when we are when we are talking about the water we need for the demand, sometimes we are. We cannot control that much because I mean we have the population. We need to to we, we we have the farmers and we need to irrigate the land. So this um this amount of water we needed anyway for for the irrigation. But but the other thing we have to think about it as well that how 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 can we efficiently use this water? So using the water more efficiently in irrigation, I think this is this is what what is very what is very important to consider. Uh, also. The, the 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 other way to to consider i mean if we are, if we are relying more on, on the surface water which is we, we are talking more about the surface water that's uh, coming from the nile river we, we can think also about other alternatives like the 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 groundwater if it, if, if it's available i mean in, in egypt we don't have that much that much groundwater resources uh i mean unless you you consider the the, the nobian aquifer or something we can also think about some of the treatment for the wastewater and and they actually i mean that's what egypt has some of the actions egypt already has taken for the last uh, uh couple of years of building uh west building some of the wastewater treatment plants and uh relying on that on, on uh, partially on on the water use in egypt plus also egypt has has putting some restrictions on the irrigation of some of the crops which are water intensive especially like rice or wheat or something so so i mean in terms of taking decisions Egypt are taking that, I mean, as far as I know from uh, uh, from my readings that Egypt has taken some actions in terms of the demand uh, side. Uh, the I thing also that I'd like to mention is uh, the term that's, that's called the virtual, uh, the virtual water, which is basically in terms of using the, the water resources you have, you are, uh, you are importing some of the crops that you need from other countries. And this is what, what, what we call the virtual water. Uh, this sometimes uh, this point is sometimes raised that uh, downstream countries can rely on importing some of the of of the of the crops so that they can probably reduce the the irrigation the irrigation water, the irrigation water used. Uh, I think that's 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 one thing we can consider, but we have to keep in mind that uh, it's not just thinking about it in terms of like water or irrigation, but here the 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 the, the economic the economy. The, 
the the economic perspective or the economic point of view here is very is very important because it's not just importing the the crops without uh, considering the, the the economy of the country and uh, uh, what they can import and what they can what they are exporting. So so yeah, I think that's 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 my take in these points. I agree. We have to to consider the demand. Uh, Egypt is taking some action in, in from the demand side. And uh, there are different options to uh, to to reduce the demand or uh, or, or or improving the water use in the, in the downstream uh, downstream countries. So, Clara said on that one uh, on terms of demand side management, and I think that is uh, that is a very uh, important. Of course, you know we have to look at maybe. Uh, so we have to look at the problem holistically, just not a water resource problem you know we have to talk to other experts from the agricultural field maybe we need to use maybe uh, crops which are most water efficient and that's where maybe the people from the agricultural sites you know there might be other there might be some variants of crops which are actually most drought resistant and also in terms of um, uh, what do you call it in terms of uh, like increasing the water supply also we need to think about something like maybe artificial uh, artificial sure. rainfall yeah. which is uh which is practiced in many countries where there is a shortage of water and that is an area actually where the countries could collaborate and share experience because imagine that is if you money to increase uh, maybe um, in arid and semi-arid area, if you wanted to increase even by maybe 50 to maybe 60 millimeter, if you increase, you know, for an area by 60 or 70 millimeter per year, that might mean huge difference to groundwater. So we have to think innovatively and about what we can do collectively. And again, that's an, that's, that's an opportunity. It's a challenge, but it's at the end of the day. And, and at the same time, it's an opportunity where the countries could, lab, could collaborate, share experience, and maybe do some experiment and see what will happen. Yeah, I, before I pass it to um, Makadalawid, I think uh, Hash, Hisham also raised the issue, the point of the ground with that. I actually argue that we should use, I think this is the word you are looking, uh, Professor Assad, as well. It's the conjunctive water use. So typically, we should use both uh, groundwater and surface uh, surface resources. We do this in Florida, the same thing, uh, and especially in, in a place like Sudan, which the groundwater and the surface water interaction is dynamic. Uh, so in, in a year when we have a lot of flows, uh, you can use from the Nile, the river flows. And then in a year when you have drought, then you can go to the groundwater to meet some of uh, the water. I know that in some of those areas, they have significant amount of groundwater and the recharge takes some time, maybe within a two years, uh, at least in similar areas, what you have in Sudan, we have studied many places, the reaction time is about 18 months to two years. So that means you can at least weather a, a drought time for a year or so, getting a little bit more into the ground. And then when you get surface water, I think they should do that. Again, we go back to the issue of data sharing. Nobody wants you to know how much they are pumping today <laughs> or even to think on, on this way. I think at some point they would need to do a uh, conjunctive water use in a sense using both groundwater and surface water. I know uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, countries they have a groundwater as well. So with that note, I'm going to pass to uh, Makeda Lavit as well. Thank you, Dr. Russo. I We have 15 more minutes, 13 more minutes, so I'll try and get one or two rounds of questions. There is a bit of interest in the chat regarding a statement Dr. Assad made um, regarding the water use in Sudan. Um, people are asking if you can confirm uh, conform or if it's verified data that Sudan is using 19 billion cubic meters because uh, the narrative so far has been you Sudan is actually using less than its supposed share according okay. to the United States. Actually, okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually ready for that one because okay. I, think, I think I have, I think, a presentation which I did to in Florida, uh, what they call it, in Florida University. And there is actually more references over there. So I think I would refer first of all to the paper, which is published in 2017 in the Journal of Hydrology by a couple of authors, 
that is a very good journal, Journal of Hydrology. If you could share the link in the chat, I think that would be of interest to the uh, participants. Uh, and then I will move on to the next question. Okay. But, uh, okay. I was trying to email some of the presentation, but I couldn't do it from here. But I think there was, uh, there was, I think from Kerry, but I would, I was trying to email the presentation for him, but I, I didn't know how to do it. But I take your time. Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't know how to do it, but it's it's general of hydrology and it's it's estimated as nineteen um, uh, as nineteen billion cubic meter per day. Again, there was uh, there was a book on hydropolitics of the Nile Basin by John Waterbury, and in page two three six, in 1975, 1976, he estimated the amount of water used in by Sudan as 17.2226 billion cubic meters. Again, there was, um, what do you call it? There was here a report from the ministry uh, about the water resources of Sudan. That is a report from the government of Sudan. And the estimate that is, I think in 1977, it's around 18.25 billion cubic meters. It's interesting meter because it also, changed and also, if they go and look at the PhD of uh, the late uh, Dr. J John Garand de Medior, which was um, uh, which was uh, which was uh, uh, what do you call it? Which was uh, the head of the political movement and the military movement in Sudan. He did his work on on uh, on John Galigalan. You will find that if you look at his PhD, you will find also similar numbers. And there is numerous, and also I have talked to uh, former engineers with the ministry, they confirmed these numbers. That's that so, definitely so there is there is there is something that we obtained from the ground. There is something already published, which is available in the public domain. So it's not something that I have invented. So no, it, no. <laughs> it, it, it is information which is available in the public domain. Well, these numbers certainly put a different narrative and a different perspective yes. in the whole water balance and sharing in Danal. And I think that's, that could be an interesting thing to pursue, uh, hopefully in a separate uh, setting. Yeah. But yes. there is another question I think that Dr. Hisham and both of you can reflect upon. It says, um, what do you think about how do you see foreclosure cases, and I assume they mean foreclosure of future developments in relation to dialogues, negotiations, and transboundary agreements? And I might add uh, to this, like especially regarding the GERD, the GERD is not going to be the last infrastructure that's going to be built in the Nile Basin. There are going to be numerous other infrastructures in the Nile Basin, both consumptive and non-consumptive. So, uh, in relation to foreclosure of future projects, how do you think, what do you think should be the relationship between existing infrastructures and new developments? We can't expect new infrastructures to bend backwards and uh, cater for existing infrastructures. It also doesn't make sense to completely ignore what is there on the ground and then just uh, move on with new, uh, new infrastructures. But there does seem to be, and with the exception of a few studies, most notably Dr. Hisham's, I don't see, we don't see this idea of adapting to changing circumstances in the Nile Basin. So I'm curious to see uh, what you both, what both of you think should be the way forward regarding on, uh, on how to synchronize existing and future infrastructures and in the case of for foreclosure of future uh, developments as well. And I think this also touches upon the idea of cooperation and trust that all of you has rightly, all of you have rightly raised so far in the, um, in the discussion so far. So um, I can start with you, Dr. Isham or Dr. Um, Assad, uh, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think, uh... I think that's a good point because uh, we always talk about the GERD, but the GERD maybe is a, is a good uh, example of what we are going to do in the future with other infrastructure and other, other dams. Because some of the data sets which are published already, uh, it's, it's, it was, it's showing how many dams or especially the hydropower dams which are planned in the basin for the future. And there are about 35 dams that can come on in the future in the Nile Basin, uh, mostly in the White Nile and Lake Victoria area, but uh, and also some of them are in Ethiopia and Sudan. So uh, these dams, which are, if, if they are coming in the future and they are 
being in the system, then it would become more complex in how to uh, to operate the, the existing dams or the existing infra or the existing infrastructure. And so it's important for for now to see how how we are gonna deal with the GERD and the, the challenges. And I believe still that the cooperation is very important. This this what what will help in the when we have the the future other future structures. Uh, uh, so I think as as we as we talk it today in this in this uh, in this webinar about different uh, solutions, especially with having an agreement with data sharing, considering climate change or climate variability, and all all all, all of of these aspects that we mentioned in in the talk today, I think they have to come together under the umbrella of cooperation between the the three the, the all the countries of the basin so that they can reach a win-win solution the other thing the other word i mean i'm talking about the cooperation but also i want to talk about the adaptive uh, operation of the existing dams so the existing dams probably they will not uh, or they cannot be operated in the status quo they have to adapt their operation based on the what what, what this the future uh, system looks like what are the what are the climate change uh, is going to impose on the system? What are the new structures that are being added to the system? So, so I, th I think my my point here is that we have to highlight two uh, two terms: one is the cooperation between the countries, but also the the adaptive operation of the existing dams so that they can uh, operate better in the future with the changes that are coming in terms of infrastructure in terms of the climate. Very well said. I couldn't have put it better. And this is something I really genuinely appreciate about Dr. Hisham's research. It's very forward looking and very realistic in the sense that it does consider existing infrastructures, but also future developments and current developments in the basin. Um, and this idea of adaptive management, I think, needs to be adopted by more scientists, more researchers. Uh, Dr. Assad? I think, you know, the future will be much more complex because, uh, you know, um, Population will grow within the Nile Basin. Again, the all the Nile Basin countries has also aspiration for economic uh, development. Issue of food security will be will be a key issue, and this is being highlighted by the current war in in Russia. That is like food security is is, is a big is a big is a big issue. So we, again, we need to think about the bigger picture, not just to think about water resources in isolation. We need to think about in, in interdisciplinary fashion. And that is with the whole purpose, you know, of improving, you know, to community uh, resilience. How do they respond to uh, extreme extreme events, whether it's floods or droughts and, and so on. But that's what require cooperation, you know, from, uh, uh, from, uh, people from you know from uh, different fields within the Nile Basin. I think there is. I think it is very very clear that is there a need for uh, for cooperation, for sharing uh, experience, and also for sharing uh, scientific uh, uh, scientific knowledge to come with with a solution which will benefit all the people living within the uh, Nile Nile Basin. Say for example here. Sometimes I try to do research on the Nile. Sometimes I will be very reluctant to put any PhD students or any postgraduate student to work on it because of data and availability. But that is, ah, oh, say that's too much risk. We do have a lot of experience in other regions of the world, but we would love to apply them to the, to the Nile. But sometimes it's just the risk of obtaining the data is it's huge and you cannot actually it will be unethical for me you know to put somebody on a project where i i have i have considerable doubts whether i will get the data or not but again you know when we make the data transferable then we could test different scientific hypotheses or different engineering solution which will benefit all the uh all, all the all the people again uh, people also now we're talking about data sharing, but we need to also to look forward about trying to evaluate what we collect now. Is it if like, then we have to ask ourselves the question, are, are we collecting the right kind of information? Do we need to augment it? Say, for example, do we have adequate rainfall station, you know, for example, within the basin? Are we monitoring uh, water quality? Are we monitoring water use? Right, so these are all uh, questions. So we have to do very comprehensive evaluation of uh, of the data needs to support um, um, 
to support decision making now and also in the future. Just not we will talk about information sharing, sharing, because well, if I don't have information, then I can't share it with you. <laughs> so, so we have to think about what do we need, you know, to uh, to manage the situation better. Yeah, I think we are uh, almost finishing. So before I pass to um, Samson to close us out, I just want to bring uh, one final opportunity for both of you to give you. And unfortunately, one has to drop off, I think. Um, so last time we held a town hall and uh, Dr. Abdul Karim, who, who was the uh, executive director with the uh, Nile Basin, worked for a long time. One thing it stuck, struck, uh, it stuck in my head uh, in terms of what's going in the short term and long term, he said that he doesn't see that uh, people actually open up in a short term. He is going to see that uh, individual countries going to their unilateral way uh, for at least you know some time uh, before they realize they have to come back. I mean, I wanted to hear more optimistic from as a somebody who partly researcher and so on, but he is speaking from the ground and what you see because of all the issue they have, distress and so on. You see, this individual's uh, unilateral you know, action is going to say, continue for some time then. What are you, what do you think in the future? What is, are you optimistic that we get uh, to a place where we will be able to try to come up with some solution that help everyone? Or do you think you agree in some sense with him that for some years probably uh, this unilateral individual uh, work will will continue because it's just there is no uh, space for cooperation right now. It's a little bit pessimistic for him, but that's I just want to to hear your final thought on that, and then I will pass it to Samson to close that out. Thank you, thank you, all. Okay, I think I for me, you know, I will be very optimistic. I think we have uh, reached. Uh, I think the countries have reached uh, critical junctures in terms of. Uh, individualistic action and again you know for for them you know to get uh, greater benefits they have to cooperate they have to cooperate and then i think that is the way that uh, uh, that's 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 a better way for going into the future Hisham, any any thoughts or thinking? No. Uh, I mean, we know what's better, but um, we're trying to be realistic given where the countries are, their postures and so on. I mean, we're trying to be realistic. Are they showing, you know, a way to open up and see or rather than trying to just, you know, uh, looking at their own benefit, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think same here. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic as long as uh, we all have good intentions to uh, develop our, our region and... Uh, uh, our business so um, I'm optimistic that I the three countries or the entire business will will will, will move forward to uh, think together that we have to share this uh, the, we are sharing the business so we have to to cooperate together and so that we can all develop so I'm I'm, I'm optimistic for the future back to you Samson Okay, it's been uh, very educational, and uh, I think it's the first uh, Egyptian guest we have on the panel. I'm very happy. I'm very optimist that uh, the experts, the scientists, stay on the science and uh, provide uh, information so that uh, politicians and leaders can make an informed decision that benefits everyone. So we'll have more of these. Uh, thank you for coming. And I was also reading the chat and the uh, uh, and the chat uh, questions. And uh, some of it will provide it to you by email. And uh, this is our first, but we're going to have more of these discussions. And I want to thank you on behalf of We Aspire. Uh, we're always optimists to uh, invite guests like yourself and have a civil discussion like the one we have today. And I want to thank you for spending time away from your Saturday, uh, from your family, to be with us. And everyone that attended this uh, session, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Teresa and Magdalawit for moderating the discussion. Dr. Asad, Dr. Isham, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks.
Recording stopped.